Oh yeah, Monday after the first NFL weekend, it's the best. Let's just play with all of our toys. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for watching on YouTube. Thank you for listening wherever you're listening. You should watch. The eye candy is absolutely insane. We got all kinds of uh, plate spinning and gags and fun and a huge show today. Here's the, here's the tone I'm going to set for today's show. You see this? This is a whole bucket of shards of broken glass. I'm going to wrap my fists in them like Jean-Claude Van Damme. Jean-Claude Van Damme in Kickboxer. No, I'm not. I am so excited to talk about the show that I knocked over the glass and there are shards all over here. And since I run so hot, and since I sweat like a maniac on the show, I do the show barefoot, my friends, you can see. So there is, what I'm telling you is, there is a better than average chance that sometime while I'm just sitting here talking ball, I'm going to step on a piece of glass. And I promise we will keep recording and keep rolling to give you the authentic, painful experience. That's the kind of stick. It's a landmine show. Maybe we'll do it every Monday. Just shards of broken glass all over the floor. In the meantime, uh, we're going to talk all the usual stuff, what I love, what I hate, what's hilarious. Um, we have really, really good stuff today. But in the meantime, before we start the show, um, I think I've missed three shots in a row. I promise, like, I'm a sort of decent athlete. But go to the sky cam. Let's see if we can set a tone. On the Kyle Brandt's basement, it's always a catch and shoot. <sighs> yeah! Bam! Say it with me. Boom! Bang! Bam! We got onomatopoeia in Kyle Brand's basement. We also got what I love, what I hate, and what's hilarious. I nailed that thing. I really do feel good. When you hit a shot to start the show, it's like doing a shot to start your night. It's just everything. It greases the wheels, baby. Let's go. Especially when, imagine... If you were to go back last Friday, even last Sunday morning, and say, how do you think you're going to start the show on Monday? 32 NFL teams, all these games going on. How will you start the Monday after the week one show? Can I get some odds, please, on the New York Giants? If you bet on them, you're done. You're set. You're set for life. New York Giants, 1-0, big blue, Brian freaking Dayball, 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 Dayball. The New York Giants are awesome right now, just for one week, and maybe it'll completely fall apart. But can you think of a way to better introduce yourself to the team and to the media and to just everyone at large by doing like the ultimate nuts in the wheelbarrow type move than just deciding to go for it for two with the game on the line it was so cool look the Giants didn't play a perfect game and Daniel Jones had a terrible interception and Kenny Galladay is still missing somewhere but Saquon looked like Bo Jackson just for one week Brian Dable looked like Bill Parcells just for one week all right and when you get in and you score the touchdown, you could easily kick and you say, we go to overtime, screw it. Dable said, let's go for two. Let's put it in the hands of our best player. Let's run this like cool little like Mahomesian almost trick play where Saquon makes them go and they go in. And I have to tell you, what if he had missed it? What if they hadn't gotten it? Then they lose. Who cares? Even if you don't get it, you still, you still win the locker room. By win the locker room. Have you seen the video of this guy? Brian Dable, now he's not one of these super cool Sean McVay, I'm young and I got a really attractive wife and I'm cool. Let's go, Dable! Let's go! He's in the middle of his players. I don't know what the dance is. I'm not going to do the dance, but I probably have about the same dance skills as Dayball. Maybe I'm going to do the dance. Look at Xavier McKinney right here with the captain. If you're, just, if you're just listening right now, you're missing out on all kinds of joy. McKinney's got the black half hair, the blonde half hair. Looks a little bit like a Cruella de Vil deal. And he is loving Brian Dable. That's one game. One game. Of all the teams that would be dancing after week one, the crappy no-buzz Giants? Think about this. Do you remember ever any shots of Joe Judge doing the dance? Do you remember ever, can you imagine Pat Shermer doing the dance? Ben McAdoo doing, no. Brian Dayball. And here's the best thing. So I live here in the New York area, so I still get a kick out of the New York Post, New York Daily News. I always like their, their wordplay game. And since the Giants have sucked for five years, they got this whole draft folder of like possible positive headlines. And they've been sitting on this one since Dave was hired. New York Post, this morning, September 12, 2022, De Balls of Steel. De Balls of Steel. They're saying he has a titanium anatomy and big Saquon up there coaches gutsy two-point call and Saquon's monster day sparked Giants in shocker I'm telling you roll your eyes if you will there is a buzz about the Giants I don't care maybe they're one in 16 shut up let them have their moment the Jets suck the Jets might be done Giants are dancing baby Giants are dancing a road win 
over a good franchise that wins every single year. Uh, and God, what is it about Saquon? You may hate the Giants. You may be a Cowboys fan. You may be a Titans fan. It doesn't matter. What is it about Saquon that is so intoxicating? We see a million running backs years after years, all through our whole lives. There's something about when Saquon hits the Jets where I'm drunk on his talent. I, I love it. He look, There's something about his aesthetics, his stride, his gait, his athleticism. I love watching him play football. He's got it all going on. He's likable. He is marketable. He is handsome. He is talented. I like his earring, little dangly earring. I like everything about the way he plays, but we haven't seen him play really in two years. Not for real. Oh man, he looks like the sick one that was promised. It was so good. Oh my God, the Giants. And the schedule coming up, soft soft especially since maybe their biggest division rival lost their quarterback for the next two months Can you imagine if those guys the giants are i don't know four and one please don't piss your pants daniel jones please i'm begging you duke boy don't mess this up it would be a really cool story i'm not gonna get too crazy but if the giants were this year's Bengals, i'm way ahead of myself way ahead of myself but we got dancing and we got a testicular wordplay about the New York Giants head coach. Maybe it's the proximity here, but I'm really fired up about it. I like it. You like it, too. Admit it. Watching Saquon is awesome. But I don't like everything. In fact, I don't love everything. We must segue, my friends. There's always a dark to every light, like a Sith to a Jedi. Here's what I hate, and you probably know where I'm going. Let's go. Sitting at the table this morning, good morning football, and we're sitting at the table at 7.03 a.m. on the Monday after NFL kickoff, and my colleague and my brother Peter Schrager looks across the table on the air and says, is the Cowboys season over? Are they done? Is, can we just wrap the 2022 Cowboys? It's a funny thing, I laugh out loud, because you'll join me in agreeing that doesn't it feel like some team seasons are already over? <laughs> it's so mean, and it's so naive, and it's probably so untrue, probably. But... I can name some teams right now. It feels like, when's the draft? <laughs> Should we start tanking now? The Cowboys, the Jets look just terrible, and I feel bad because their quarterbacks hurt too. There's a couple other teams. I don't even feel like saying on camera that their season might be over, but I think you know who we're talking about. The Dallas Cowboys. It's not that Dak gets hurt. Dak gets hurt. We understand that. Dak, maybe it's just bad luck. Maybe there's something about the way he plays. He gets hurt. Here's what kills me about the Cowboys and there are many things you want to start a family you your wife your husband whatever it is and you buy your first home okay and it's 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 not the greatest thing of all time but it's your home your pride of ownership and you really enjoy it it's got curb appeal and you're going to raise your family there and um you don't have any home insurance because ah, I don't know we snuck through the cracks somehow they let us have it and uh the, the, we don't have home insurance but you know we'll just roll the dice the house burns to the ground Everything gone, down to the foundation. People, we're safe and everything, but the house is gone. Just terrible disaster. You didn't have any home insurance. You're ruined financially. You have to borrow money from your parents. Your debt and your credit and everything's just a nightmare. A life-changing thing. Years later, you get another house, okay? You build it right on the same spot. You build that house back up. And you're like, we should get insurance this time. Like, that was crazy. We never want to go through that again. You know what? Let's screw it. Let's roll the dice again. Are you sure? I, I think we're required to have insurance by state and federal law. Ah, screw it. I know how to get through and beat the system. We can save some money. So you don't have insurance. A weekend. Flood. The whole house is flooded. Pipe burst while you're away. Flooded. Whole house ruin. You see what I'm saying? This is the Cowboys. Dak is the house that burns down sometimes. Beautiful house. Very expensive. Floods. Termites. They've been through it all. And they their, their insurance is, is Cooper Rush? That... That's like the general. It's worse than the general. Maybe the general's a sponsor of the show. I hope not. Just like imagine that the insurance that you see at 3 a.m. while you're watching Cheaters and it's on before the bail bonds and the cash for gold commercials. That's the insurance policy that the Cowboys have. And they're the Cowboys. They've got a house on the hill. They're the billionaires. In fact, I don't even know if they have that policy. And it's just so stupid and so arrogant. You know, I know you got all the stars, Jerry Jones, and you got to... The jerseys, and you got C.D. Lamb. You don't need C.D. Lamb and Zeke Elliott. You know who you need? You need Colt McCoy standing there on the sideline with a baseball cap and a clipboard, and the second Dak breaks his leg or does whatever, breaks his hand, Colt McCoy comes in, and over the six games, Colt McCoy can get you to 3-3 three and three, 
or shock the world and get to four and two. Why do I have to tell them this? It feels like the season is over because Cooper Rush is not going to light things up. And I just don't think Ezekiel Elliott has it in him. Now, the answer should be, and this is what's so frustrating for Cowboys fans, this is why I hate this topic, H-A-T-E with the Cobra Kai. Okay, so Dak got hurt. That sucks. It's terrible. I like Dak. I don't want to see him get hurt at all. It was a freak thing with his hand. All right, so your quarterback's hurt. You have a star running back making 20 million bucks a year. You have a star receiver, and all these stars are in air quotes. You have a Super Bowl winning head coach. You have some sort of alleged prodigy at offensive coordinator, and you got the ownership who will do anything to win. So why are they royally bleeped? Because all that stuff is just smoke and mirrors and a mirage. They got Micah Parsons. That's what they got. I'd rather Micah Parsons start a quarterback next week than Cooper Rush. I bet he could actually do better. It's so frustrating. And this is why I hate talking about them. Because it's just so pretty and so flashy, mirror, mirror, smoke and mirrors, nonsense. And then one injury goes down, done. And here's the thing. The silver lining, and this is a very morbid silver lining for the Dallas Cowboys. The silver lining of the Dak Prescott injury is that we are talking about that, thereby giving them an out from hearing about how awful they were before Dak Prescott got injured. They were terrible. Number one offense last year, and they had three points. C.D. Lamb, like the, the next number of the, the member of the 88 club, he has his own commercial eating Chipotle with the other 88s, doesn't belong there, has done nothing to earn it, was targeted 11 times by Dak Prescott and caught two passes. It's not a thing. It's not happening. And this is why I try to tell people, stop talking about the Cowboys. The America's team thing is from my parents' generation. The it's good for ratings thing is from the 90s when NFL on TV was blowing up and the network contracts were exploding and they were winning Super Bowls. They've won squat since. Think about, look at the NFC East right now. Eagles won. Giants won. The Commanders won. And the Cowboys lost and now it feels like their season is over. I hate that that's happening. Believe me. We don't talk LeBron here. We don't talk politics here, and we'll talk very, very little Cowboys here, only when absolutely mandated by a big headline like Dak Prescott gets hurt. You know why? Because I hate doing it. But here's what's hilarious. Let's get after this. I love doing this. Uh, Dallas Cowboy, famous one. Here they are again. Michael Irvin, only person under the sun, as far as I know, other than myself, who got to go on TV and pick an MVP, NFL MVP for this year. And you know who Michael Irvin picked? Not Dak Prescott. No, 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 no. Michael Irvin picked Kirk Cousins, just like I did. Michael and I, we, we, are, we are brothers in the Kirk Cousins worship fraternity. And guess who looks pretty good after week one? Michael Irvin and this guy. Kirk Cousins came in, slapped around the Packers. Justin Jefferson does whatever he wants. Throw it here, throw it here, touchdowns. And then I, I want to make sure that you guys are ready because everyone thinks it's a joke. And everyone thinks Cousins is a joke. And they keep waiting for him to lose. And you say, oh, you're just saying Kirk Cousins for clickbait and just for views. No, I'm not. I'm saying Kirk Cousins because I'm paying attention. And he has the best offensive weapons in his huddle of any team in the league. And he's got this new, young head coach who looked great yesterday against this allegedly really solid Packers defense. That's why I picked Kirk Cousins. Plays in a dome. Knows how to chuck it. So I just want to make sure you're ready. Because it is coming. I get it. Herbert, Allen, Mahomes, all fantastic. Maybe they pack each other off and cannibalize a little bit. Kirk Cousins. And here's how I want my MVP to show up. Authentic. Authentic. Not not trying to be some poser. Not trying to pose for Instagram. This is how Kirk Cousins shows up from his post game after he shows it to beat the pack. My man, if you're not seeing this right now, how dare you? I want you to understand something about Kirk Cousins in this picture. This is week one. It's not like, wow, week 13, I'm kind of tired of dressing up. The season's getting late. Like, you know, laundry was piling up. This is your like first string outfit. Your first string from your car, in his case, probably a PT Cruiser, into the locker room. He sat there and like, yeah, I think I'm going to go with that like kind of beige, short sleeve, plaid dad shirt. And that is Kirk Cousins. And I could not respect it more. You know, is that cool? Hell yes, it's cool, because the definition of cool for pro athletes, in my opinion, is not giving a damn what anyone else thinks is cool. Kirk Cousins wore that shirt because he's comfortable in it. Now, it does beg a question, how can I get my hands on that shirt? How can you get your hands on that shirt? That shirt should be the new cool thing. Remember when Pharrell wore that hat that looked like an Arby's logo? It's fine, everybody freaked out. This is my Pharrell hat right here. And so, you go to the masses, you say, hey, Anybody have any idea where Kirk Cousins, who I think is going to be MVP, and by the way, Kirk Cousins is making $40 million this year. 
and he bought a shirt that looks like it was $17.99 at TJ Maxx. That's why I love him. But as far as finding it, I asked you guys, where do you think Kirk Cousins got that shirt? And you guys had the thoughts. Should we just get into them now? Bring up the responses. Okay, great call. RJ says Aero Postal. Aero Postal. I don't remember. That's a store that goes back in high school in the mall. I think it means airmail. RJ thinks that Kirk Cousins is, is, still has a shirt from Aero Postal, either from when he was in high school, or maybe he goes to the website. What else? Let's run through them. This is important work, guys, because Kirk Cousins is the MVP. We need to know where he gets his stuff. Paul Paps, super producer extraordinaire for the Dan Patrick Show, says Patagonia. It's got the moisture wicking, I love it, and SPF 50 sun protection blend. Kirk Cousins has a terrible history of getting sunburned and having issues with sun protection, so that would be good. Paulie, we love hearing from you. You guys think I'm not going to actually find this shirt and wear it? Here I am. All right, Drew Drew goes to Kirkland Signature. I think that this is right. I think that Kirk Cousins gets his clothes at Costco sometimes. I think maybe his wife buys him the clothes for him. Is there anything more perfect than Kirkland? It has his name right in it. Kirkland. It is where he lives in Kirkland. And he wears Kirkland brand. Can you imagine if the first ever athlete you haven't endorsed Kirkland brand was Kirk Cousins? It is his name. Kirkland people, get off your butts and get Kirk Cousins some more money for wearing your stuff. Next, I think Kirkland Signature is it, though, and I'm going to find out. Rob Michael says J.C. Penney's end of the season reduced rack. That would make sense. Look, I, I know Kirk a little bit. This whole thing about him, like, I'm not going to say frugal. I'm not going to say cheap. I'm going to say be very dis- decisive with his money. This is a guy who goes to Outback Steakhouse and pays with a gift card. I'm not kidding. This is a guy for his 30th birthday was going to try to pay Creed, the band, not the, the office character, not the Apollo uh, Creed's kid. I'm talking about Scott Staff and the band. He was going to try to pay them to do a private concert at his home for his birthday. And I think he balked at it because it was too much money. Making $40 million this year. Give me one more tweet. I could do these. This could be my own show. Van Heusen, <laughs> currently 75% off the whole store. And Cousins just runs in there. He scrambles. He lets go of his kid's hands and runs into the mall and just says, give me all my shirts. I need uh, eight home game shirts. I need nine away game shirts. And this guy says, looks like the Coles Croft and Barrow brand. I don't know the Croft and Barrow brand. I, someone else told me there's something called Coles Cash. And it's from the Moe's Schrute Collection. That's what L says. I think we may have a Moe's Schrute Collection sponsorship as well. This is the fun. All right. Patrick Mahomes wins the MVP. Great. Our guy Josh Allen does it. We will celebrate right here in the basement. We need a Kirk Cousins MVP where in Kirkland Brand as he accepts the trophy and then goes out for a nice dinner at the Bubba Gump Shrimp. That's the kind of MVP we want. Lions, Tigers, and tailgates. Oh, my. College football season is always the greatest time of the year. You put on a jersey, get your face painted, break out the foam finger, but it's all about the food. And nothing gets you more fired up for game day than Eckrich Smoked Sausage. They're naturally hardwood smoked and have the perfect blend of spices. From buffalo sausage dip to sausage chili mac and cheese, Eckrich Smoked Sausage is a quick way to bring flavor to all your tailgate meals. Visit Eckrich.com for easy, one-of-a-kind sausage recipes. Eckrich, you do you. And we're just going to keep reading Kirk Cousins' tweets. This is going to be a three-hour show. We can't do it. Today is a great day for takes. Takes in the NFL landscape. It is also a great day to round them up and have some takes on those takes. That's what we call the segment. Go ahead and roll it. Here we go. I have not stepped on the glass yet, but I'm going to wander into the minefield that is the takes across this great media landscape of ours. I got numbers here. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and we got clips. Our intrepid Kyle Brent Space and staff has been searching through the uh, the murky fields of Takeville this morning to find out who has the strongest, funniest, boldest. We know it's the categories we go in. We're looking for delivery. Uh, we're looking for originality. And we're looking for a little bit of heat on it. Where do you go for that? Look out. Speaking of broken glass, I feel like this is the Stone Cold Steve Austin music that I just have to hit right now. First, first up, Stephen A. Smith, my man. I know Stephen A. I've hung with Stephen A. And he's got a take about what else? The Dallas Cowboys and Dak Prescott's injury. Stephen A. takes on takes. The floor is yours. 
Is the cowboy season already oh. over in all seriousness? Oh, with this in major all injury? seriousness. First of all, I'm <laughs> mad that you asked the question because it almost took my thunder away. The season is over. <laughs> I mean, one game in. How many times do I have to say this, Dan Olowski? How many times do I have to say this, playmaker? Just wait. <laughs> Don't wait to be patient. It's coming. <laughs> the only bad part about all of this is that I like a little suspense. I mean, this is television. I'm looking for theater. You understand what I'm saying? Sure. I'm not thinking that, you know, week one, I mean, damn, the die has been cast and it's over. But what other decision are we to come to? Your number one receiver is gone. Your number three receiver is gone. Mm -hmm. Your number two, who's become a number <laughs> one, we don't know if he's ready to be a number one. Your running back's a question mark. And now your star quarterback is down for six to eight weeks. Now, when you look at the NFC East, Giants, Com Commanders, Eagles, we get all of that, so you got a chance. But in the grand scheme of things, ain't nobody think about the Cowboys. Season's over, bro. Season's over right now. <laughs> all right, a lot to like there. A lot to, a lot to like. I have to start out first with a little sports media nuance that he went with. Uh, Molly Karam, who I also know and really respect. Um, I like how Stephen A. was clearly irked the way that Molly asked the question. She said, is the Cowboys season over? And Stephen A. wanted that to be his soundbite, where he waits for his single camera and looks around and says, the Cowboys season is over. So he was a little perturbed that she posed the question that way. Nothing outlandish, but I picked up on that. I think we did too. Um, a lot of things. I like the way when he's listing the other teams, the NFC East, he says, you know, the Eagles, he says, the Commanders, kind of like in air quotes. We all are kind of saying Commanders in air quotes. It's just not quite catching on yet, even though they are 1-0. and And then, look, delivery, it's always going to be good with him. He's doing his thing. Creativity, not really, maybe not at all. I mean, he, he's certainly walked that uh, block many, many times. But then the Heat, he, Stephen A did make a good point in that if you are hoping for the schadenfreude of watching the Cowboys get burned alive year after year, as they have for now 27 years, week one, it's a little frustrating. You're like, no, that was just some, that was just this, this game against the Brady in week one. Let's, let's, let's bait the hook a little bit, right? Let's butter everybody up. So I think he made a, a lucid point there, a lucid point there where it's like, give us the little hope before you kneecap us. Like I'm thinking week seven, week eight, I think Stephen A. has a better Cowboys taking him, but I do think he nailed this. Uh, number one wide receiver gone. He's just talking about Amari Cooper. Number three, Michael Gallup is down. Number two, C.D. Lamb is there. He's not productive. He didn't even talk about Mike McCarthy, which, by the way, when all those players are injured or are not available, that's when the head coach needs to be like, I'm the man. And nobody thinks Mike McCarthy is the man, including his boss, his players, and probably himself. So, uh, Jerry Jones, I'm sorry for this, my friend, but at least you had some big numbers today. I'm going to give this... Interestingly enough, I can't find the number I was thinking for. Maybe that's an omen. I was going to give it a... You know what? This is Stephen A5. I, I was going to give it a 6, but for some reason my 6 is missing. You know what? If I had any creativity at all, I would have done an upside down 9. But that's just escaped me right now. Uh, 5. It's like when I used to spell boobless on my uh, calculator. 5 for Stephen A. Who's going to take out this one? We need some guy with some punching power. Just give me someone, I don't know, maybe West Coast based, you know, to represent each side and someone who deals in takes and metaphors, a seasoned radio guy. Do we have something from Colin Coward? You better believe we do. From the Colin Coward podcast, he's talking about the Patriots and Belichick losing to the Dolphins. Can Colin Coward beat a five? Let's find out. It's one thing to struggle. It's another to be bad. It's another to be bad boring. The Patriots are a bad watch and Robert Kraft is a businessman. I do not think it's crazy okay. that the Patriots go 6 and 11 or okay. 7 and 10. That Kraft goes into his office at the end of the year, makes him a consultant. Bill moves down to Jupiter, Florida with his girlfriend, goes golfs, hang out like Jimmy Johnson on a boat, uh, maybe does some television. But but they're not just bad. They're slow they're unwatchable, and frankly, as I watched that game, it was embarrassing. This young offensive coach for the Miami Dolphins and Tua toyed with him. A rookie head coach and Tua toyed with Belichick. Okay, lots of like there. First of all, you know why I laughed right when we started playing the clip? 
is because Colin's doing this thing where he goes into this secret serious voice. You've heard Colin's voice for years. Everybody has been paid attention to sports media. Not in this case. He's here as if he has a secret, and it immediately draws you in. And it's like he doesn't want someone outside the room to hear because he's giving you privileged information. And what he's going to do is tell you that Bill Belichick is going to be a consultant down in Florida. Lots of like on that one. I, I like that he put a record on it. He said 6-11 and 11 to start, and then he softened it up a little bit and went to 7-10. and 10. I, mean, I might lose a point from the East German judge for that. Um, I like that he... Uh, he said they're boring. They are boring. Um, <laughs> I like a lot of it. I like, I think the, and then he piled on. It was almost like the greats know, like the pro wrestlers almost, like when they have the crowd and Hulk Hogan is doing the I can't hear you thing. He called them embarrassing. And then he did really good shots at the end about Mike McDaniel out coaching Belichick in his first game ever. Here's the problem. The other category we don't measure in takes on takes is um, potential for going cold, meaning the Patriots win next week by three touchdowns, the Patriots end up making the playoffs or at least pushing for it. I still am not going to pile on New England after week one. I'm not going to pile on New England. I'm not going to pile on Cincinnati. I'm not going to pile on Green Bay either. I have seen too many times over too many years where good teams have terrible week ones. Terrible. Terrible. They don't play their, their, their players much in the preseason. There's a chemistry thing. It's awkward. They're down in Florida. They're wearing navy blue jerseys from head to toe. We'll see after week one. But that's never stopped Colin before. That's never stopped the take artist. And in a true like battle of, of the Giants here, this is, this is really good. This is almost like The Rock versus Stone Cold. I'm going to give Colin a seven and the win for saying after one game, in the season following a playoff season, that Bill Belichick is going to be forced into retirement, pseudo-retirement, by Bob Kraft. It was one game, and they were on the road where they've never won. They're 0-4 against Tua. Really premature to say not, I think the Patriots will struggle. They're going to be embarrassing, and he's going to go down on a boat with his girlfriend. You know what? Change it. I'm changing it. Never mind that. I'm not locked in anything. That's an 8, Colin, especially in that rushed uh, soft, sort of immediate, frantic voice, like, don't tell anybody this. That is an eight. Stephen A., you got beat by three points. That is my take, and that is takes on takes. We got to go now to brand awareness, though. I'm not aware of all the headlines. Sometimes Sam Pepper needs to make me aware of them. In fact, sometimes still, our guy Anthony Jimenez needs to step in and make me aware of the takes. Give me the fake USA Today graphic. Let's go. All right, there he is, Wally Pip. I mean, Anthony Jimenez. Anthony, a far more striking figure uh, on camera than Sam Pepper. You have matching glasses, matching shirt. You have a whole host of awards behind you. How are you, and how does it feel to be in doing Sam Pepper's job in Brent Awareness? I'm doing great. I mean, you call me Wally Pip. I wouldn't go that far, but I also have peppers for dinner that I'm getting ready to make oh, stuff yeah! that my wife picked me <laughs> out. So I also blacked out the supermarket. I learned from P. Diddy Combs. Unless you're cutting a check, I'm not giving you free pub. But these peppers are oh going to be cooked gosh. tonight for sure. So this is an honor of Sam Pepper. Understand what Anthony just did. There's a Sam Pepper, not a doctor or a sergeant, does our show. And Anthony went out and got peppers. They're actually stuffed. <clears throat> he had props. That's why I respect you, not to mention the whole series of AVN awards you've won over your head. But keep me aware of the headlines, Anthony. What do we have in the news today that I haven't covered yet? All right, so we'll start with the first one. Russell Wilson makes his return to Seattle tonight on the heels of ESPN's Brady Henderson's report that Wilson was, quote, livid with head coach Pete Carroll for letting up in a 27-20 victory against the Atlanta Falcons back in October of 2019. Yeah, that petty. Perhaps costing Wilson a shot at the MVP that year, ultimately yeah. won by Lamar Jackson. All right. So, Kyle, with that backdrop, what are you expecting from Russ tonight? Well, the Russ and Pete interaction is interesting. Uh, those guys are over each other. It, it couldn't be more obvious. Did some great things together, but I, I don't think they're each other's big fans. They really are not. Uh, I think there's going to be a perfunctory little, like, handshake and half hug. That's it. Like, th there is not going to be this embrace. This was a breakup. They got sick of each other. This report's, I mean, hilarious, that if you didn't fully understand, there's a report that Russ was mad at Pete because he thinks that Pete deliberately kind of tanked him in the MVP uh, consideration that season, which is also kind of dovetails off another report that the reason that Russ threw the ball instead of handing the ball to Marshawn in the Super Bowl 
this I, I've talked to former members of the team about this. They believe that that he didn't want Marshawn to get Super Bowl MVP. That he actually did want Russ to get it. It's all just nonsense. It's all like junior high election stuff. But it always is a little bit corny with Russ. And I'm trying to use that word respectfully because he's a really good player and by all accounts a good guy. But corny, guys. Corny. I, even if you are like a diehard Russell Wilson fan, and that's part of his charm. Like the, the Mr. Unlimited thing, is just, he just made that up. He made it up completely. And I was trying to think like, is there ever, a, is there been a cornier, very successful athlete ever? A-Rod comes to mind for sure, but then A-Rod became a villain and was a Reuter and all that stuff, and then he, it's just a whole different deal. Now in the media, maybe he qualifies, but Russell Wilson, you want an example? Like, this is so Russell Wilson, it hurts. He's coming out on the practice field, and I wish you could see the video. If you're listening to the podcast, watch the damn thing on YouTube. He comes out, he points to the sky, fine, but then he, he does air high fives. He, like, fakes his high fives, I'm telling you. So imagine the door opens, he walks out, Hits the chest, points to the sky, and then holds his hands out to imaginary teammates or fans or something. It is almost a little truncated version of when he was doing the fake huddle on the field last year. It reminds me of Star Wars Kid. Remember 15 years ago when you'd go on the internet and you'd go to E-Bombs World or something and there was Kid doing the Star Wars laser battle just by himself? Except this is Russell Wilson. He knows he's on camera. He's really successful. He's really famous. And of course he does the air high fives. Of course he does. Uh, that's Russ. So I had tend to believe all these things with Russell Wilson that he actually was mad he didn't win the MVP and he's never gotten a vote. And by the way, Russ, there was no way you're going to beat Lamar Jackson that year. But I think things are going to be a little frosty tonight because Pete's a little corny himself. And not and by a little, I mean like, I mean back to USC. So I don't think there's going to be a lot. And if they do, if they do smile and like do hands on the shoulders and everything, forced. Forced. I, I think I, I would rather have them just do the full cold exchange. Anthony, are you are you picking this up? Do you agree with me? And can you name a corny athlete as successful as Russell Wilson? Ooh, a corny athlete as successful as Russell Wilson is a tough one. I mean, I think we were talking before the show. A Rod comes to mind a little bit. He was more of a villain yeah. than anything else. But yeah. Russell Wilson just leans into it. I mean, he also has Ciara, so I mean, I'll be He's got corny everything. with Ciara as well. Easy for me to call somebody corny. I'm wearing a Jean Claude Van Damme T-shirt. It's fine. I understand. Glass houses. What else is in the news? All right, last, not, not to mention for tonight, the Manny Cast. Make sure you guys tune in as well. And yeah. Tune in too. All right. So with barely 20 seconds remaining in overtime in the Texans Colts game yesterday afternoon, Coach Lovey Smith decided to punt the ball on fourth and short on the court's 49-yard line, opting to play for the tie rather than go for the win. Interesting choice. Kyle, what was your take on Lovey's decision? It's fascinating that it's buried this far in the show. It's fascinating that it's not leading every show across every network. And it's a commentary on the Houston Texans. And it's a commentary on, on Lovey Smith. Understand, if the Chiefs or the Bills or the Rams or maybe 15, 20 other teams had willfully taken a tie as they did, that is the biggest story of the news cycle by far. Lovey Smith, what was it? It was third and three? Or fourth and three? Fourth and four? It was, it was fourth and less than five really short and he decides i'm just gonna take the tie we're gonna punt and that's it and i will take the tie and then he spoke about it afterwards and he said it's better than a loss i, I mean the, if you go back with lovey if you're classically trained on lovey i'm talking about back to chicago bears time back to the rams all that stuff he is he is a, a southern sort of speaker a slow guy he believes in what he believes in and by slow guy i mean slow speaking guy um Believes in what he believes in. Rex is our quarterback. We play defense. There was nothing that was going to apologize from him about this take at all. That he says, I think he would do that a thousand times out of a thousand. What is his post-game speech? We need the video inside the Houston Texans locker room where they hold up a ball or say whatever they say. They say their little piece. And it... What is his explanation? Guys, we had a fourth and a few yards, and I... Instead of trying to throw a little pass to the flat or over the middle, I, I just feel we should just take the tie because it's better than a loss. That is so bad. I mean, that's awful. And I understand they're like they're rebuilding and everything, but put it off what would Don Brian Dable did to start the, start the show today. Brian Dable said, screw it, guys. We're going for it. And he's dancing with his players in the locker room. The Houston Texans locker room, once he finishes, they're like, what the hell was that? And what does Davis Mills think? And what does someone like Brandon Cooks think? Why didn't we just go for it? We're in the middle of the field. You want to give us one play and we can win the game? I just think it's awful. And the most embarrassing part of all of it is that no one seems to care. If, imagine if Tomlin had done that at the end of the Bengals game. Or even if Zach Taylor had done it. The world is burning. 
I can't believe Mike Tomlin did that. Logan Smith's like, ah, yeah, I guess it's rebuilding. Very strange. And it gives us a tie, which is one of my worst, one of the worst things in football is this. Let me get a quick sidebar. Let me get a quick sidebar, Anthony, if you don't mind. Just stand by with your stuffed peppers and everything. Quick sidebar. A, I don't mind ties. I think it's fun come playoff qualification time. However, I do want to address one thing. Every single time there is a tie in the NFL, one of the most popular dumb jokes to post or to tweet or anything is to say this phrase that I don't understand where it came from. And it's, ties are like kissing your sister. Have you seen this? I bet if you search it right now, there's a bunch of people who have tweeted, oh, a tie, a tie is like kissing your sister. What the hell does that mean? I say that as someone who has three sisters. Kissing your sister is a loss. There's no tie there (laughs) whatsoever. It's complicated and it's a strange thing, but in what way did getting intimate with your own sister equate a 13-13 final score? I don't know how that became the final joke. Kissing your sister is not a win. It is not a tie. It is a terrible 56 to nothing loss in which everybody gets fired afterwards. Please don't tweet that. And if you, someone you're following tweets it, please remind them it is not a tie. Sister kissing is a loss. Again, I got three sisters. It's never happening. And, I, and if it did, I certainly wouldn't consider it a tie. I would consider professional help. That's the quick sidebar. And they had to get that off my chest. Anthony, you have a sister? I do have a sister. I have an older sister. But just to give you the full context of the quote, it came from George Brett. Did you know that? Former Kansas City no. Royal? Okay, no. so the quote is, if a tie is like kissing your sister, losing is like kissing your grandmother with her teeth out. I, I mean, I, I, I used to kiss my grandmother before she passed. She had her teeth and everything, but like, that was just a generational thing. We would kiss a little bit. But, I don't kiss my sister. Would you consider that a tie if, if you woke up one morning and be like, yeah, you made out with your sister last night? No, like that's, that's traumatizing, right? Absolutely. Never had the urge. <laughs> Thank God. I knew you had your head on straight. This is one of the strangest sidebars we've had yet on the show. But that's what happens in the tie. People okay. tweet that thing. Uh, bring us home. What else we got? All right, so the Trey Lance era did not get off to the start that 49er fans had anticipated following a sho- rather shocking defeat to the Chicago Bears. Adding salt yeah. to the womb, Bears corner Jalen Johnson said the following post game. I don't know if you heard this. He said, what do you think he is? He ain't do ish. We made him play quarterback, mm. referring to Trey Lance. Spicy. Kyle, what do you make of those words? Yeah, sp- spicy like the stuffed peppers. You know, I was seeing the people this morning saying, um, you know, the Cowboys should trade for Jim Garoppolo, which is just like has so much hot sauce on it. It, it. There's a million reasons that wouldn't happen, even if they should. If they call the 49ers and say, hey, w- we think we need Jimmy Garoppolo, the Niners are going to say, we think we need Jimmy Garoppolo. We're not trading him away. Did you watch our game? No, 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 no. We, we are not getting rid of him. We think we're going to have to put him in. Now, they're not going to admit that out loud, but if any watched the game yesterday, Look, the biggest thing that Trey Lance has going for him right now is all that rain. Because it felt like it wasn't really a game. It felt like he has an exception and a way to get out. And you maybe get a pass, an asterisk, if you will. But it didn't look good. He threw an interception at Eddie Jackson. It's just a known fact amongst Bears fans. Eddie Jackson, their safety, has not made a huge play in four years. And he made a massive play the other day. And that's because uh, of Trey Lance. He, you get one rain game. That, that is your get out of jail free. That's your one. Unless there is buckets and buckets of rain going for the Niners in week two, it's going to get ugly fast. I also heard they were asking a bunch of guys in the Niners locker room to just make sure to have Trey's back this year when things go wrong. That's like high school election. That's like a clicky, like make sure your team Trey. This always had the potential to be bad, and they never envisioned losing to the Bears and him playing that badly. But again, get one out. It was a strange day. I don't know how good Jimmy Garoppolo would have been either, but that's it. There is no two jail, get out of jail free cards. That's it. Is this Brant's awareness? Are you eating the peppers? You earn another trophy? Let's go. Bring us home. Come on. Give me stories. I, I got another one. I thought you were team me up, but I got it. Harrison Ford emerged in the D23 yeah. Expo on Saturday to reveal the final teaser for Indiana Jones 5 and announce is an secret to the mm-hmm. Kingdom Crystal Skull. It would be his final time playing the iconic Indiana Jones character. Yeah. All right. So, Kyle, you know you love movies. Harrison Ford coming back to the Indiana Jones franchise. Are you pumped or is it time to give it a rest? I'm in a glass case of emotion. Very, I, I, I'm, I've been thinking about this for years. And by the way, I call BS on him saying it's going to be his last time. There'll be an Indy 6 at some point. Here's the facts. Indiana Jones, um, depending on Harrison Ford's charisma, performance, and physicality. I'm going to talk about the things that are going for it, things that are not. Things that are going for it. 
understand that he's 80 years old. 80. He, not 70, not 76. Harrison Ford is 80. And of course, he should work and be in movies and stuff, but is he swinging across the whip and, and, and trying to keep the Molarom from ripping his heart out? That's a lot of demands on an 80 year old man. Here's what's going for it. First of all, we're coming off Top Gun Maverick, all right? It's the, the nostalgia rich, older lead uh, doing this old role again and people liking it, maybe some cameos from past movies. Different age group, of course, the two of them, but that's something going for it. Um, the other thing going for it, he did Harrison Ford, Harrison Ford did Han Solo again in the Star Wars Episode Seven. was very good, the best part of that movie. But again, not fighting people. He's not, he's not jump kicking Nazis and hanging on to the front of trucks like Indiana Jones has to. Things that are going against it. Did you see The Irishman? Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, all that. There is a scene that is so cringeworthy, that is so unintentionally funny, in which Robert De Niro is trying to do the Robert De Niro thing where he beats somebody up outside of a deli or a meat store or something. And oh my God, he looks like the Johnny Knoxville old character he does with Spike Jones and Jackass and he's running and he's beating him up and he's beating him and he's supposed to be young and he's supposed to be all physical like Max Cady and Cape Fear and it's hard to watch and they age reduced his face and everything you can't do the body so if there is a moment in this movie in which Harrison Ford again Indy fights Nazis it's what he does it put him on the map I don't know who the enemy is going to be in this but there's going to have to be those big cannon shot punches it's going to have to be swinging dun 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 at 80 years old, I don't know if you can sell that. James Mangold is a director. He's great. He's tenured. He did the Logan movie where Hugh Jackman was getting older, but Hugh Jackson wasn't 80. Here's the funniest thing. Indiana Jones fans, you understand this. Anthony, you wouldn't because you're not a fan of the franchise. Um, Sean Connery played Indy's dad in the, the Last Crusade. Okay, He was looked at as like the grandfather. When Sean Connery was in The Last Crusade, he was 59. 59. Harrison Ford, now 80. I feel like I'm going to watch that movie. I'm going to be so nervous. Almost like when you're at a Thanksgiving dinner and your grandfather goes on some diatribe about something he's not supposed to be talking about at the table, except the diatribe is going to be about swinging on a whip across a ravine. Uh, quickly, Anthony, I, I go way back with the franchise. Very personal to me. As someone who's not into them at all, what is the likelihood or what would cause you to go see Indiana Jones 5 in the theater and how would you feel about it as a guy who doesn't get it? Yeah, absolutely nothing. I've had no interest at this point to watch Indiana Jones. Uh, watching the what, the fifth film in the franchise? No, I'm out. Yeah. You're out. Just out. Just one of the great yeah, American out. characters of all time, the great American actor. Why are you so disinterested? I'm fascinated by that. Never mind Indiana Jones. I'm just not interested. I mean, my buddies always play this game with me. Like, have you ever seen this film? And ultimately, I always lose the game. Like, if it's not a mobster movie, like, I've seen Goodfellas. I've seen all yeah. the Godfathers. I've seen Scarface. But like the classics, I'm just not into it. I guess my attention span is just not there. It's my fault. I blame my parents, actually. I, 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 your parents, listen, as long as we don't blame your sister, because you didn't kiss her, and it wouldn't <laughs> I'm not be a tie if you did. That's Anthony Jimenez. Never seen Indiana Jones. Never kissed his sister. I, I, I agree with one of those things. Thank you for the brand awareness. We have to take it home now, guys. So much we've been through already today in the basement. Um, before we say goodbye, we do this the same way each and every time. We throw a dart. Over there at the dartboard. Give me this guy cam for a sec. We go to the dartboard over there. It's a real dartboard. And there's a bunch of topics that the producers have made up. And it's a random topic. There's 1 through 20, really. And if I hit 12 on the dartboard, i got to talk randomly about topic 12, 14, 10, whatever they may be. It's been told to me by my staff that I only have two pitches. I only, I, all I hit, what are the numbers again, Flynn? I hit an 8. <laughs> I'm, o I'm only capable of hitting a four and an eight. So here's the topics up in front of you. Everything from what is the most random jersey you own to what's the worst concert you've ever been to. I went to a good concert over the weekend. That wouldn't qualify. And then there's a whole second page, which I guess is irrelevant because it's 11 through 20, and the only thing I can hit is four or eight. You would think I'm actually trying to, and I'm good at darts, and I'm not. If I hit 11, you get a Days of Our Lives anecdote, which is ripping from the headlines. But let's see what I hit. All right, all I hit are four or eight. This is how we end the Monday show of Kyle Brandt's Basement. Here we go, firing. No, it wasn't a four and eight. Guess what it was? It's right on the line. And my friends, we got new territory. We have a nine, a nine, ladies and gentlemen. What is topic number nine? Worst concert I've ever been to. All right, so I usually go to the Sky Cam for this. What's the worst concert I've ever been to? All right, a lot of different ways to go with that. I went to a great concert over the weekend. I went to Pearl Jam at the Apollo Theater 
which was insane to see a band that big in a place that small. John McEnroe was there. Baba Booey was there. And Robin Quivers. Um, who else was there? A bunch of people. Oh, um, I don't remember. They said that the Obamas were there, but I didn't see them. And maybe they were sitting up in one of those, like, uh, those boxes they had in that place, you know, like where the king sits or you know, Abraham Lincoln before everything went bad. But that was a great concert. And the set list was you know, a little bit frustrating, but they still were awesome. Worst concert I've ever been to. Um, I saw, and this is a legend, and this is from my parents' generation. I saw Bob Dylan once, and this was about 12 years ago. And let me couch this by saying I respect the great uh, American songwriter. And <laughs> man, I, I, I felt as if he was propped up by a broom on stage. That someone who brought him out there put a broom up the back of his jacket and planted it into the floor, and that was the only thing that was keeping him upright, like a scarecrow. And he, he kind of went through the song and says, "How does it feel?" And it, it, it didn't feel great, Bob. Um, so I respect that you still went out on stage, but you know I, I did pay for the ticket and I did pay for a, a plus one. So. It doesn't give me great pleasure to sit here and say Bob Dylan sucked in concert 12 years ago because he's a very elderly man and I already am going to take some heat for saying Harrison Ford's 80 years old as Indiana Jones, but it was not a great show. There was not a lot of stage presence. I don't know if the command of the lyrics was that great, but you asked. I'm forced to answer. I could have said Vince Neil as a solo act in 2003, just drunkenly slurring his ways through Kickstart My Heart, but I went with Bob Dylan. I've been to a lot of bad ones. Um, thank you for joining us today. Listen, I don't usually say this stuff, but, you know, like, share, subscribe, do a rate, do all those things. It helps me do this show. It helps me talk to you guys. I hope you're watching on YouTube. You can listen on, a, on the podcast. I'm getting in a workout. Just what I needed, more sweat and more glass in my feet. We will see you tomorrow. Josh Allen, tomorrow we'll see. He's uh, late. He's got Monday uh, night football next week. So maybe it'll be tomorrow, maybe Wednesday. Come check us out in the basement. We're out of here.